So welcome everybody to the 23rd edition of the AMAA conference, or to be precise, the International Forum on Advanced Microsystems for Automotive Applications. When we started planning this event, we wanted to cover the fundamental and systemic changes that the automobile is facing. What we did not expect though, is that it's not just the car that's being disrupted at these times, but it's also the way how we are organizing conferences. Therefore, AMA 8 2020 is coming as a virtual talk. This time of the year, usually, around 100 or 200 leading engineers and researchers from all around the globe would gather here in Berlin to present and discuss recent developments in intelligent and electronic systems and smart components that make the car of the future. And even more importantly, they would use the extensive opportunities for networking and the informal exchange that we are usually offering at the AMAA conference. Such is particularly important in a time of change. Therefore, we had planned the AMAA conference to be very special in this regard, namely as a co-creation conference that would leave room for jointly developing future concepts from an engineering and from a user perspective. Well, with COVID-19, as we all know, it's all different. But as you can't come to us, we are bringing AMA to you. So here in Berlin, we are uh, not at a fancy conference hall today, but at the offices of VDI, VDE, IT. And instead of a stage, we are using a video conferencing system. Also, we are not 100 or 200 people, but just a handful. For now, it's my colleague, Caroline Zacheros, and myself, Gerian Meyer. So, Caroline, the title that we chose for AMA 2020 is Intelligent System Solutions for Auto Mobility and Beyond. Can you explain a little bit for the audience what our thinking for this is? The road transport sector is changing rapidly. So, therefore, the transformation of the automobile means a fundamental shift from an autarkic car to intelligent and connected systems, meeting not only individual user needs, but also environmental goals. Therefore, the European Union and the Green Deal of the European Union is aiming to accelerate a shift towards a sustainable and smart mobility by promoting automated, connected and shared, um, as well as electric multimodal mobility, extended by um, digitalization, as well as bringing technical and um, societal aspects together within a co-creation process. Hereby, smart components, as well as modules and architecture, and the integration into networks of data, as well as um, power and services, are key to enable the automobile of the future. Solutions are related to um, road vehicle automation, electrification, and um, sharing services and concepts that are reflecting the need on an integral view of multi um, modal mobility as a system, including intelligence as well as intelligent mobility systems and smart traffic management. Besides technological innovation and disruption, behavior changes are needed to meet environmental goals. So furthermore, future um, mobility trends need to be re-evaluated and new concepts, especially for urban mobility, even beyond the automobile, need to be put in place within a human-centered approach, leading to an integration of technical as well as user-oriented aspects. The overall transformation towards um, a clean, connected, automated and shared um, mobility is currently facing a new challenge. Beside the necessary paradigm shift from um, individual mobility towards a multimodal system, um, including shared economy with a combination of public transport, the pandemic crisis right now is going to shift the priorities for the automobile and the mobility concepts, as well as um, the research need behind that. As we can see here, before the COVID-19 crisis, we were generally aiming towards a sharing economy. However, 
with um, the pandemic situation, it is very likely that the um, privately owned mobility is rising again and therefore sharing options will have it even more di um, difficult than before. Therefore, new concepts, especially also with respect to disinfection and further security measures, security and safety measures need to be discussed. So um, new technology approaches, especially with respect to automation, will very likely experience a wider acceptance in, within this society. The robot taxi, for example, are um, very likely to be more recognized um, within the society and this may result in a boost for these products and services and their respective developments. Additionally, as we can also see here, automated robots might be a great potential for the um, contactless operation and delivery of um, goods and parcels. However, with and without the crisis, it can be concluded that we need an integral view of a user-centric, clean, connected, automated and shared mobility um, as a system to address technological, societal as well as political challenges within a co-creation process and to achieve an inclusive, sustainable as well as um, seamless mobility. As we just heard, the priorities are changing under the um, current situation. However, I think we are going to have an exciting future um, ahead of us. So the AMAA conference primarily is an event for technologists, as you know. But it's also have putting a strong emphasis on innovation policy as well. Whether it's electric mobility or automated driving, many of the recent hot topics of public interest have been discussed here at the AMAA for pretty much the first time. I remember the conference in 2009, for example, when we covered the recommendations for research funding on electric vehicle technologies of the European technology platforms Airtrack and EPOS. And those later became the fundament of the European Green Cars Initiative and the current Green Vehicles Initiative, two public-private partnerships that were established in the first place as recovery measures of the financial crisis. Currently, the strategic plans of the partnerships or for the partnerships of the new framework program Horizon Europe are much discussed. And we are in a time of crisis again. So I think it's good time to talk about European research and funding policies. And our first guest is actually an expert on that because, well, that's Jean-Francois Aguinaga the head of unit Future Urban and Mobility Systems at the Directorate General for Research and Innovation at the European Commission. Hello, Jean-Francois. Can you hear us? Yes, Gary. Do you hear me? Very good. We can hear you very well. Jean-Francois, can you explain us a little bit what role automotive and road transport related technologies will play in the future planning for research and innovation policies in the new framework program? Yeah, first of all, I would like very much to uh, thank uh, the organizers of uh, AMAA 2020 to, to, to invite me to, to this uh, virtual uh, talk. Um, first of all, I would like that uh, we come back a little bit on what we have today in terms of uh, partnership in particular, of course, uh, you will have in this session uh, Stefan Bauer, uh, uh, the president of uh, the EGV, which is the only uh, um, partnership, CPPP, which is uh, available uh, today in this uh, period of Horizon 2020, which uh, started in 2014 and will finish at the end of this year. So one single CPPP and very much centered uh, on the vehicle and the clean vehicle in particular. 
So this is the situation, and uh, we will uh, make uh, 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 extra efforts under the next framework uh, program, which is called uh, Horizon Europe, which will start next year in 2021 and finish in 2027. And in this context, we will have a successor to the European Green Deal vehicle, the current uh, CPPP, um, called to zero successor or not uh, is a good question because uh, probably uh, while the current uh, green vehicle initiative was centered on the vehicle uh, the uh, successor uh, will be very much centered on the system so which is a, a, a very different uh, focus so i leave it to you um, to consider whether um, uh, to zero with the next uh, co program partnership for electrification will be the successor or not of uh, the European Green uh, uh, Vehicle Initiative. But in addition to that, we will have most likely a partnership on batteries, electric batteries. We will have uh, most likely a partnership on cooperative, connected, and automated mobility, and very much centered on the vehicle. So altogether, we have a sort of a, a very interesting group of partnerships where synergies will be very strong, of course, and they, they need to, to cooperate. In addition uh, to that, I would like also to mention that uh, we will have a partnership on hydrogen, and as part of the tasks for 2.0, um, you will see that uh, uh, the integration of uh, hydrogen, for example, for heavy duty uh, vehicles, long distance, will be part of the scope of 2.0 uh, partnership. So 2.0 um, overall will be much more systemic, will have also uh, an interest in uh, working on charging stations, which is certainly a, a potential uh, deblocking factor uh, to boost uh, uh, the uh, electric uh, vehicles' interest from the con consumers. And again, the integration of uh, hydrogen will be part of the scope. So, all Jean together, Francois, the, um, to Jean Francois, to my understanding, uh, the planning um, is looking into all these different technology fields but as far as i know your unit is also in charge of uh, of one of the missions of uh, the um, uh, horizon europe framework program and that's the mission yes. on cities um can you yes. explain a little bit how the partnerships that are very much driven by technologies and their applications so electric vehicles automated driving uh, fuel cells and hydrogen or batteries how this is linked to this bigger issue and this bigger challenge of developing sustainable cities and transportation in sustainable in, in future cities. Yes, okay. Um, before going to the mission, which is certainly a, a, a novelty under Horizon uh, Europe, I would like to, to mention a couple of things. Um, we will have certainly a very tough discussion uh, under uh, the German presidency as to uh, the uh, financial uh, framework for the period 2021-2027. And this will condition, of course, the effort we can make uh, for the partnership uh, under Horizon Europe, because uh, the link uh, between Horizon Europe and the uh, so-called MFF, the financial uh, framework, uh, are absolutely uh, direct. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there was a sort of uh, uh, cap which was also imposed during the discussion with the Council and the Parliament as to the level of uh, budget to be dedicated to partnerships. So this is also a, a sort of, of obstacle. Now, coming to the mission, it is true that my uh, unit is in charge of developing a mission on cities. We have set up a mission board uh, selected through uh, a very 
uh, intense uh, uh, selection process uh, from uh, 556 uh, candidates to uh, uh, mission board members with uh, 15 uh, members. Uh, and these uh, members are uh, helping us uh, developing the idea of something uh, uh, which is um, not technology based. This is a, um, a vision of uh, cities where uh, we, we are interested in developing uh, cross cutting actions, uh, covering, of course, uh, clean mobility, but also clean energy, efficient energy, uh, uh, waste management, uh, heating and cooling. So all the different aspects with an impact on climate. Because for the time being, the working title of this mission is 100 cities climate neutral by 2030 by and for citizens. So the idea is to organize in the selected uh, cities uh, a, a, a number of sessions of citizens' engagement in order to define the priorities. Why do we do that? We do that because maybe uh, we like uh, the, 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 the democracy uh, as such, but uh, in addition to that, if we want climate neutrality to be uh, uh, available by 2050, uh, this will lead to a number of very deep transformations. And if you want to be successful with this level of transformations, you need the support of your citizens. So this Jean means that... Uh, Jean-François, yes, the, um, the, the big thing for the European Commission in planning the coming framework program is co-creation. And you already explained yes. a little bit about the potential, the opportunities for citizens to participate in the planning. Beyond that, there's many stakeholders, researchers, people from, from companies that would like to have an influence and that would like to know what's going on in the planning process. Uh, how can people actually participate? And what is the, where, where are the ways they can access these discussions and have their say? Okay, first of all, uh, co-creation uh, starts uh, in-house, meaning that uh, we have uh, 12 DGs uh, working all together in order to support the mission board uh, with uh, all these experts which are uh, trying to uh, prepare a report in order to guide uh, the, the actions to be, uh, to be taken by the Commission later on. So this is one point. Secondly, of course, we are working with member states. We are, we are also uh, uh, pushing to have as many uh, citizens engagement uh, session, sessions as possible. And of course, we will have at a given point uh, of development of this document and probably in September, October, um, we will have a, a, a time a step where uh, everybody will uh, have the possibility uh, to give uh, uh, the, uh, the opinion, the, the opinions they have, uh, the ideas they have uh, during a, a public consultation, uh, which will uh, be uh, organized. Yeah. This will start most likely during the RNI days. You remember there is uh, still this year this uh, big conference which will be uh, virtual, by the way. Um, and this uh, will be an opportunity between the 22nd and the 24th of September to discuss, maybe challenge the ideas uh, uh, exposed by uh, the mission board members. So uh, altogether, there will be a number of uh, uh, clear opportunities to participate in this uh, conversation. Perfect. That, that's very good to hear, uh, Jean-Francois. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for, for the, um, the information you have shared with us and all your assessments, and also with let, letting us know how to participate uh, in the events and uh, the Research and Innovation Days in September, even if um, virtual like this AMA talk. So thank you. Have a very good time, and uh, thank you for your time and your patience.
Bye bye. Pleasure to, to participate in this session. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-François. What we call co-creation is not completely new. Since more than a decade, the European Commission has tried to establish a strategic dialogue with, on research funding policies with companies and academic institutions, and they created European technology platforms for that. For the topic of auto mobility and road transport, the counterpart of the European Commission clearly is the European technology platform ATRAC, the European Road Transport Research Advisory Council. We are now having Stefan Neugebauer, the chairman of AirTrack and also the chairman of the Association of the European Green Vehicles Initiative, Public-Private Partnership, here with us in the, uh, in the talk. Stefan also works for BMW as a director of Global Research Corporation. So hello, Stefan. Hello, Gerion. So Stefan, from the perspective of European companies and research institutes, how strongly do you feel being involved in co-creating the European Union's future agenda of strategic research and innovation in road transport? Gary, on, in general, the co-creation process works and you can feel that a lot of engaged people are working hardly to set up uh, this program. Um, but to be honest, the process is really complex and it's effortful. For more than two years, uh, nearly every day we have discussions, meetings, workshops, uh, exchange of documents. And we are talking about the initiatives in our sector for road transport, which means an initiative for batteries, an initiative for hydrogen, an initiative for cooperated connected automated mobility and a partnership for decarbonization of road transport, the towards zero partnership. And so the final result after all these dis discussions, it will not be a surprise, but uh, it is a challenging multi-step process. We started some time ago with a partnership fish around about five pages. And for me, from the industrial perspective, this describes perfectly what should be done. But then we have to prepare a partnership proposal with around about 50 pages. And then actually we are working on a strategic research innovation agenda, another document with around about 50 pages. And then we have to develop a research roadmap. And then we came to the final result. Yes, let us make a um, partnership on decarbonization of road transport. So we are looking forward to have a more forward oriented and lean process uh, in the future. Okay, that's very good, Stefan. Um, still, my, my question is a little bit, um, actually the, the European research funding, as we all know, is even more complicated than just having the companies and the research institutes discussed with the European uh, Commission. Uh, the money in the end of the day is coming from the member states. Do you feel that the member states and the European Union are very closely aligned here or that the, rather the companies and the member states are aligned? Is there any recommendation that you can make for that? I think there is room for improvement. Um, from the very beginning, you can feel that the European Commission uh, hardly tries to involve uh, public uh, stakeholders uh, uh, to have uh, openness and from the very beginning uh, we had the online consultation the involvement of consumer organization of ngos and so on but this is good and this is uh, needed but we should not overestimate it my feeling is that at the end 99 percent of the input are coming from the traditional stakeholders and what we have in mind that with such a complex process for many years, uh, we um, create a critical situation for SMEs and for sm small and private entities because they do not have the capacity or the financial resources to follow the multi-annual uh, process. And the second point is that we um, have to balance the technical expertise versus the political guidance from the European Commission. 
and we have to balance it carefully. Um, I think, and my feeling is that in the targets, we, we really have common targets and we have the targets to use 100% renewable energy for transport. This is the decarbonization and it's in line with the Green Deal. We want to be emission free in urban areas and we want to have zero impact emission in rural areas from road transport. So we have a common understanding for the targets. But the question is how to achieve it. And the European Commission needs to keep the technology neutrality. And sometimes this was my impression, impression that the European Commission or some, some people try to dictate the technology and even for specific segments. And this would be a no-go area for our liberal and plural, pluralistic society in Europe. So but, hmm? go ahead, go ahead. Pol political guidance for objectives, yes. Technology directives, no. This is up to the um, researchers to find the solutions. Uh, Stefan, in uh, the second part of this year, uh, Germany will have the European presidency and uh, so it will have a very strong role in, uh, in, in Brussels and uh, in, in view of that and as you are like us uh, from Germany, um, how do you see um, the role of the member states in the strategic planning for the uh, Horizon Europe framework? Look, the European uh, partnerships, they are uh, partnerships between the European Commission and the private stakeholders. So these are the research institutes, the universities, the industrial players. Um, these are the two parties, but for the setup of the partnership and for the targets, of course, the national member states, they have to agree and they uh, need to be aligned. And therefore we strongly uh, uh, support the strong involvement of the member states and the whole program for research has to be agreed and adopted by the uh, member states. Um, therefore, um, in this next uh, period of this year with the German leadership, Germany uh, will have the, the moderator uh, role um, for for this uh, for these partnerships, and I think now we have a good alignment with the European Commission. Uh, we have some conflicts, to be very clear. We had some conflicts. We had a strong uh, discussion with uh, the European Commission, and we found a compromise, which is acceptable for me. It is not perfect for me, but it is acceptable. So I do not want to reopen. Uh, from my perspective, this discussion. Uh, and I hope that the national member states, uh, they will agree to the compromise uh, uh, which we found with the European Commission. Uh, thank you very much for these insights and thank you very much for your time. Uh, if you want, you can stay in the call. We have uh, uh, another um, uh, person to talk to. At the AMA conference, we are not just covering future cars and the systemic frameworks um, of their safe, efficient and reliable operation. But we are particularly also focusing on enabling technologies. And we are looking here into electronic components, the embedded software and the integration of all these into smart systems and smart cars. And actually the AMA conference therefore is one of the big events of EPOS, the European Technology Platform on Smart Systems Integration. Therefore, I'm very proud to introduce now our next guest uh, to you, and that is uh, Stefan uh, Finkbeiner. It's another Stefan, as you may have noticed, the chairman of EPOS and the CEO of Bosch SensorTech. Stefan, um, how can innovations in smart system technologies contribute to achieve the future vision of sustainable future mobility? Yeah, I think smart systems will be an essential contributor to manage the challenges of the future. So if we talk about transport, for example, we talk about electric cars. You have to manage electric cars. You have to sense it, you have to steer it. It's a new challenge for really having sensors managing large current ranges and uh, doing uh, electric cars management. That's one part where uh, EPOS can contribute. And it's not only the sensing, it's the whole system which we also contribute. So electrical drives, how do you manage the different systems? That's all smart systems which bring these, uh, these uh, uh, local systems together to complete system. 
And that means, of course, uh, being becoming better on these systems, maybe on electrical price, on electric motors, but also on the steering and making local decisions in maybe subsystems. This is where smart systems are very important. And that means, of course, uh, developing the hardware, the systems themselves, but also more and more um, the local intelligence and software of these systems. So being able to make also a local analysis of a system, is it getting too hot? How is uh, the system performing? Giving feedback to maybe a central gateway. And this is where, uh, where sensors are coming into the game and let's say also smart sensing and acting solutions. Another area is, of course, autonomous driving. If you think about, you want to make local decisions, you ever want to have a car on the road, which has to, to decide very fast. So there is no real time for accepting latencies. You have to make um, local decisions of a LiDAR sensor, of a radar sensor, or combining the systems. And this is exactly the task smart systems have to do. Uh, evaluating signals, uh, um, analyzing, and maybe transforming to real, uh, uh, signals you can work with and then maybe combine the signals with different subsystems to make then a decision if a car has to be stopped if you have to, uh, really to turn your car etc cetera, etc cetera. therefore Stefan, um, Stefan Epos is one of the main contributors to the partnerships uh, in the partnership on key digital technologies KDT um, and we heard a little bit about uh, the partnerships already from the previous speakers uh, can you explain a little bit the interplay of this KDT partnerships and the more application related partnerships like the one on automated mobility and electric mobility? Yes, um, I uh, tried already to give some examples. So let's see if you look from the EPO side, from let's say the sensing side, you need high performance sensors, which give you a, a very precise and long term stable signal to really steer um, a, a guided car, an autonomous car. And this is where you have to develop new sensing technologies, means more precise sensors, which maybe also need less power and uh, which are able to give really already pre-evaluated information to make faster systems, uh, fast decisions in a car. So that means sensing, that means also acting, and that means also local evaluation of the signals inside a sensor cluster, for example, an actor cluster, and maybe also the combination of these subclusters also uh, to give guidance to maybe an autonomous car. So whereas the, 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 the building blocks to my understanding are developed within the KDT partnership, the application and the integration into the, the environment say of a car that's rather in the, in the partnerships on automated mobility and, and, and electric cars, correct? Correct, and it starts with the hardware. So we still have to develop sensing technologies. That's still important to have uh, better sensors and new sensors. For example, for electrical driving, hydrogen sensors to manage these kinds of systems. So it's still also developing a significant amount of new technologies, sensing technologies and acting technologies to manage these future transport systems. Uh, Stefan, you know, yeah, I have one, another question that um, is addressing you in, in your role as a, as the CEO of Bosch Sensor Tech. My understanding is that uh, you are not at all looking just into mobility applications, but actually in a wide range of, of potential applications of sensing systems and smart systems. And, and now COVID-19, the pandemic is coming into play. Does this change your product portfolio or does it, this change uh, the, the, the things you are in the devices that you are developing? Um, actually, uh, it does not change it too much. I think the, the sensors uh, which we are developing are offering maybe new opportunities within uh, uh, these uh, critical times. If you talk about COVID, for example, a pressure sensor which is used in a car, which is used in a smartphone, may also be used in the ventilation system and there are new opportunities. And I think this is also the nice things about the KDTs. Yes, we have driving markets to uh, request better sensors, better actors. But the nice thing is that you can also use a reuse, at least the technologies. Maybe you have to adapt the, the product itself a little bit in different applications. So what has been developed for a car maybe 20 years ago is in a smartphone uh, today and maybe in an e-health system tomorrow and in a ventilating system, maybe even already this year. And that's the big advantage of also this, let's say, APOS technologies, the, the smart uh, system technologies. So it's cross uh, application. Uh, you can really make reuse and uh, 
apply the sensors not only in automotive but in smart transport in, in smart health um, in all, uh, automation technologies uh, and of course also in what we cl I call it classical consumer electronics so head mounted sensors body mounted sensors etc there's a huge space of application which is um, also contributing to the benefit of the of the society in the next 10 to 10 years Th thank you so much. Thank you very much for these insights and also uh, thank you very much for, for your time. Uh, actually, I'm thanking all the three um, speakers in this uh, opening of the AMA virtual talk. So Jean-Francois Aguinaga, Stefan Neugebauer and uh, Stefan Finkbeiner. This year's AMA book is covering very relevant research topics, starting with um, smart sensors, connectivity and intelligence, as well as safety, security and validation. Furthermore, um, we are complementing the discussion by um, human factor related topics, um, enabling connected and automated driving. Additionally, a wider perspective is going to be achieved with contributions to the intelligent mobility systems and the AMA book will be rounded off by electric mobility topics. Although this year's exchange um, within this conference will be a lot less interactive as it was planned, we are still wanting to share um, some of the key technologies enabling the deployment of connected and automated driving within this session. Therefore, our first talk will be um, given by Uvidio Vermesan. He's the chief scientist at Sintef um, Digital in Norway, and he's currently working with projects addressing different aspects of integrated automated systems, intelligence connected, uh, intelligent connectivity, cognitive um, systems, security, and IoT with applications in different fields such as um, green mobility, energy, and smart environments. Ovidio, how will advancing vehicle architecture enable electric, connected, automated, and shared mobility? Thanks, Caroline. So uh, my presentation will focus uh, on the uh, evolution of architectures for uh, electric uh, connected automated and shared mobility so the vehicles behind this uh, concept are called ECAS uh, vehicles and um, the evolution uh, has shown in the last uh, years uh, very high dynamic with the um, um, different generations uh, of vehicles that were identified 10 years ago by a project uh, run under Artemis. The project was called uh, Pollux. The four generations actually match very well the development that we see today in the implementation of uh, electrical connected, automated and uh, share uh, mobility. As you see in the figure, uh, picture that uh, it's on the left side. Uh, the first generation was addressing the electrify uh, architecture. The second generation was uh, addressing the integrated mechatronic systems. The third generation that match as well level three in uh, the automation uh, levels was addressing multi-functional uh, uh, architectures and the generation four uh, was addressing the, the value-based architectures that actually match very well the level four uh, in uh, the automation uh, classification. Level five is not yet uh, uh, presented in the picture, but this is the one that uh, actually will integrate all the function that we expect from the ECAS systems. In uh, the discussions on the architecture evolution is very important to look at uh, different uh, levels. So architecture, the sensor and actuators levels and evolution that uh, is coming from uh, that side. Then on the system architecture, uh, the part that uh, uh, relates to the electric and the electronic uh, architecture of the vehicle. And then the 
application uh, architecture, which means the integration with the intelligent infrastructure. So if we look at the mobility transformation, we see that uh, actually in the next uh, few years, the focus will be clearly on the ECAS vehicles that will bring uh, the uh, enabling technologies to uh, have the transformation to uh, digital mobility uh, systems and bring a lot of uh, benefits, uh, societal benefits that uh, we are uh, envisioned in uh, the climate neutrality, zero pollution Europe uh, in the part related to a sustainable transport and the transition to a circular economy. This uh, is possible by um, providing ECAS uh, vehicles with new mobility modes, multimodality, and with new functions that are integrated uh, in the vehicles that uh, are um, allowed by the new AI techniques and methods that uh, now we will see will be integrated in the different functional domains of the vehicle. If you look at the evolution of the vehicle architecture, in the last uh, 10 years actually was an acceleration in the uh, changes of uh, the vehicle architecture from gateway-based and distributed uh, electric and electronics uh, architecture, where each function has an ECU, to domain-based uh, electric and electronics architecture, where we have uh, domain-based uh, issues where the sensors and actuators were connected to these issues and the issues in the different domains were uh, exchanging information and communicate over um, common uh, connectivity bus. And this uh, uh, in the last year this uh, development in the architecture has further developed into uh, centralized uh, electric and uh, electronics architectures in order to provide the connectivity and processing capabilities that are needed in order to uh, process the vehicle function that are uh, needed for ECAS vehicles. In order to advance the architecture, advancements in structure design, in uh, in-vehicle, intra-vehicle, inter-vehicle communication network, and the computing platforms were uh, necessary as the future ECAS vehicle will uh, process maybe terabytes of data, will exchange data with the infrastructure, will exchange the data with other vehicles and other uh, type of applications and uh, services. If you look at uh, the vehicle view, in the last uh, few years, the number of sensors that were integrated in the architectures has increased dramatically. If we consider level three uh, automation, we had maybe 18, 20 uh, sensors including radar, cameras, leaders, uh, ultrasonic sensors. In the level four, uh, it's expected to have around 24, 28 uh, sensors that will be integrated in the different uh, uh, domains of the vehicle. While for level five, it's expected that uh, 32 to 34 such sensors will be integrated in the vehicles. This again requires a rethinking of the architecture and rethinking as well of the domains, the functional domain of ECAS uh, vehicles. A paradigm shift we see it, and uh, the functions like sense, locate, think, connect and act will be the main elements that will drive the development of the ECAS vehicles. In the figure on the left side, you see the different uh, uh, domains with the functions that uh, actually will be developed and will be uh, further integrated in uh, these domains for uh, ECAS uh, vehicles. We will see uh, a 
evolution, further evolution of the architecture from diversified edge-based uh, vehicle architecture with uh, zone ECUs to uh, kind of standardized federated cloud edge-based vehicle architecture where we will see a combination of the in-vehicle architecture with uh, the infrastructure, intelligent uh, infrastructure architecture in order to create new services and applications. And I will try now to conclude uh, this short uh, presentation that uh, actually uh, has a scope only to be an appetizer for discussion of, uh, around the future development of electronic and component system that will support uh, these uh, new architectures for ACAS vehicles with a number of challenges that we see uh, today. One, it's uh, the development robust perception and sensor fusion technology over vehicle lifetime. New AI-based vehicle hardware and software cognitive platforms that uh, becomes uh, a very important element in developing the new uh, sharing computing capabilities and uh, function virtualization for these vehicles. Integrated fail operational component systems and platforms that it's a must for uh, ECAS vehicles. Integration of multiple uh, connectivity concepts, um, including vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure, vehicle to pedestrian, internet based application, and uh, dynamic context aware uh, intelligent infrastructures. Simulation tools and uh, virtual validation and test automation. One of the presentation after this will address uh, this important uh, challenge. Dependability and trustworthiness by design and ethical frameworks in the case of uh, ECAS vehicles uh, applications. Fully intelligent uh, mobility systems and applications. And last but not least, standardization, certification, and legislation in a global policy framework. Thanks for your thank attention. You. Yeah, thank you very much for the great talk, Ovidio. Um, it looks like we are still having a lot of challenges to overcome. Of um, course, my, of course uh, yeah. the road is not uh, ending here. It's only uh, opening. This is true. Yeah, my question regarding that would be, um, can all those challenges, I mean, I guess, except the standardization and legislative um, challenge be addressed from a technological point of view, or do we also need to integrate um, more societal and um, framework aspects to solve those issues as a whole? So uh, as uh, you notice, actually the whole, uh, uh, mobility ecosystem is changing. So new, first of all, stakeholders are involved. New relationships are built in order to uh, create the new services and applications. And of course, in order to address these challenges, you cannot rely only on technology. You have to extend uh, and involve other stakeholders and society at large, because at the end, one important element is the adoption of this technology. If you don't have uh, um, acceptance and the adoption of technology and uh, the interest of the society to use it and uh, the people that will uh, benefit, then uh, the technology will not help. Yeah, I agree with that. Thank you very much again, Ovidio. Thanks a lot. Okay. As um, we just learned from Ovidio that um, vehicle architecture is one of the key elements for the deployment of electric connected, automated and shared mobility. However, as has been already mentioned also, is that intelligence inside and outside of the vehicle is uh, important to further promote um, those mobility concepts. Andreas Kuhn, the CEO of Andata, will further elaborate on this topic. Um, he is the co-founder of um, Andata and he's working already more than 16 years with topics related to simulation and AI-based developments, as well as 
protection of vehicle safety systems and um, traffic as cooperative holistic system in a system. Please, Mr. Kuhn, can you um, present your um, viewpoint on that? Yeah, thank you. Uh, why are we doing all this? Why are we doing connected and automated uh, driving? And as already stated and mentioned in very uh, number in numerous other presentations and publications, we do this first of all for comfort, for safety, for increasing traffic efficiency, uh, for, traf for vehicle efficiency, all, and also for traffic effectiveness. These are the main reasons why we are doing this. But uh, I will refer to some of our presentations, which you may find on the internet, or also look for some more papers uh, from us, uh, then you will find out uh, that all these benefit categories are conflicting with each other. So you cannot just run straight for one of them. So if you are going uh, very intensively for safety, then maybe your vehicle may become a traffic obstacle and then you are losing some of your performances with respect to traffic efficiency. And we have found a lot of such uh, very complicated and complex interdependencies between all these influence factors and, and performance uh, uh, measures uh, that uh, we cannot just uh, do it on the base of conventional development methods. So what we need to do, or what we need to have, uh, we need to come up with very difficult and sophisticated methods and uh, scenario-based uh, uh, artificial intelligence, simulation-based uh, development, all these are some passwords which are really necessary for doing this. But today I will also uh, uh, highlight a, a, a different issue. This is uh, with respect to one of these, I would uh, go more into the issue of traffic efficiency. And uh, let me show you here this example. Uh, it take, take a thought experiment and think about uh, if each of these cars in this picture uh, would be an automated vehicle. So who should take over responsibility to resolve the situation? Will this be the green car in the middle? Will this be some uh, cooperative intelligent, uh, swarm intelligent algorithms? Will this be some algorithm in the cloud? Will this be a huge central computer in Silicon Valley? So who will take over responsibility to resolve this? Any idea? No, what, I, what our very belief is that uh, this will be or will stay very similar to then it is today. Traffic control still needs to be into place and especially traffic control uh, will be much more elaborated and will have to be much more complex and much more functional because it's not only uh, saying red and green to some uh, subsets of the traffic participants, uh, it's also advising each single traffic participant how to do and how to resolve because in our opinion, single vehicles will not be able to resolve such situations. So what's the consequence? The consequence is that we need to reinvent or re-engineer uh, traffic control for cooperative, connected and automated driving. And this is taking the need for a very holistic system of systems thinking approaches. And also we do not have to talk about uh, only automating single vehicles. We have to talk about automating traffic, traffic as a whole system of systems. Yeah, uh, and how should, this be done. Uh, in our opinion, we also have uh, introduced an architecture for doing this. Uh, we don't believe in centralistic structures. We believe in, in decentral structures. And this may be a logical architecture how to do this, uh, beginning with a single vehicle. As my uh, uh, as video said, uh, of course, all the vehicles will be very sophisticated and have a lot of technology inside. But anyhow, if a single vehicle can do and can run autonomously on the street and there is not much density and not much traffic, uh, then of course they will do properly. But once a traffic situation is becoming dense and we're having saturated traffic situations, we 
don't believe that the vehicles will be able to resolve this uh, individually on themselves. Uh, then at some certain threshold levels for density or for, for speed and density reserves, a superordinate uh, control instance need, needs to come into place. This instance, for example, in a conventional way, they already exist. And this is, for example, a node control, like a traffic control or traffic light at an intersection. But of course, in future, with much more functionality and possibility, not only saying red and green to some of the subset of uh, traffic participants, but also giving some more sophisticated and more detailed uh, uh, advice on how to approach uh, and, and uh, pass uh, certain street sections or infrastructure. Uh, again, for the nodes, if you have a subsequent uh, number of nodes, uh, these will also not be able to resolve the traffic situation themselves only running autonomously when there is no jam or no congestion. If you have congestion in any of the node controls, uh, then and again a superordinate uh, a control instance comes into play, uh, which is the line control. The line control then uh, by clever selection of control strategies and giving targets to the subordinate control instances uh, may be able to sort out. And this type of, of uh, control architecture can be yeah, extended uh, hierarchically, uh, horizontally and vertically into uh, any scale. So this is not limited to four uh, hierarchical levels. Uh, this is, uh, yeah, can be scaled arbitrarily. Each of these control patterns or control objects uh, follow a similar a similar control pattern, uh, which is shown on the left on the left side, and we uh, were able to define a very generic uniform control uh, pattern for all of these. And why are we doing this? Because uh, if we are talking about automation, then you really need to define the processes uh, completely. Uh, automation cannot be done without a, a very clear and very crisp and very uniform description of the processes. And uh, for process, I mean the control process, the calibration process, the adaption process, also the, the selection of the control uh, strategies and also uh, how these all fit together. That way we can come up with unified procedures uh, to be able to calibrate, teach, uh, learn, adapt all of the control elements in a, in a similar way and under a, a similar process pattern, which is uh, mainly based on uh, scenario-based approaches where for each of the, of the uh, hierarchical levels, we can uh, implement scenario-based simulation-based uh, uh, scenario catalog where a lot of simulations are underlying and they describe or collect uh, all the different possible traffic control action, also the vehicle control actions, also with variation of, of all the relevant traffic situation and behavioral models, uh, partially taken from test fields and also from naturalistic driving or from, from data coming from the cars, which is observed and interpret the, the behavioral patterns of the drivers themselves. And this scheme then is, is a general uh, learning scheme where um, automatic cars in a very concerted way can, le can learn from each other. And uh, some of the infrastructure elements also learn on their level of, of in the hierarchy. And that way we will be able to come up uh, with a, let's say, full automated or full automated level uh, uh, traffic control and traffic uh, uh, coordination for cooperative and connected driving. And in our opinion, this is one of the, yeah, also another uh, prerequisite for the automation and for the vehicle automation. Uh, and this has to be embedded also not only in a, in a common process scheme, but also uh, in, in some stuff like uh, dedicated test fields where we 
do in, in, in co-simulation, co-adaption, co-learning. Uh, and uh, that's, in our opinion, also a, a major cornerstone for enabling uh, automated driving with such kind of distributed intelligence over several hierarchy levels and not only flat over all the domains. Thank you very much. So as I understood it right, you, you or Andata in general is telling that um, the traffic man uh, the traffic automation is more important or rather the critical point compared to uh, individual um, vehicle automation. So in this regard, would you say um, that infrastructure intelligence is more important than in vehicle intelligence? No, you need both, but uh, having a very sophisticated vehicle alone uh, does not bring any benefit. Just putting an automated car onto the onto the road uh, will not be sufficient for gaining any of the of the benefits we want to achieve with vehicle automation. Uh, the benefits will only be able to uh, we will only be able to uh, gather all the benefits if we do not only think about single vehicles. We have to think about a system of system vehicle traffic as a system of system uh, of many vehicles and we have to uh, think about the whole the whole traffic system as one holistic uh, scheme yeah very right thank you again for the presentation so beside the technological needs that we just were um, discussing already testing is a major requirement for the actual deployment of connected and automated driving Therefore, Just Bernasch, um, which is the managing director from Virtual Vehicle Research um, Center, that is the largest research center related to virtual vehicle technologies in Europe, is going to um, present his thoughts on it. So, Just Bernasch, why is testing so important? Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot for the introduction. Uh, why is testing so important? Uh, testing needs to be faster and better, uh, but why? So we we see a very complex uh, scenery. I think it's, it's from, from India, not, not so common, unfortunately, for Europe, but just to symbolize uh, that traffic sceneries are really, really complex. The human being is quite good in understanding and reacting uh, to certain scenes. But if we analyze traffic scenes, for example, for uh, the um, uh, emergency traffic assistant. You know, so the emergency traffic assistant has to understand what is uh, happening around when uh, it, is, it is fine to break as an emergency break. Then if we analyze uh, causes of accidents where, where things doesn't happen very properly, uh, we can see that 50% of the accidents uh, we can identify about 25, 26 causes. So this is to be described quite easily and easily to implement for the system. But to address the second 50% uh, of uh, all the, the accidents uh, which are happening, we have more than 5,000 different causes and combinations of elements in the situation to be described. And if the effectiveness of the system should be better than the 50%, uh, we have to deal with all this complexity. And to deal with the complexity, uh, to test a wide variety of, of scenes with different um, people and, and cars are being involved, like in the presentation we have seen uh, just before. So in order to describe complex scenarios, uh, you have to combine a lot of different simulation models to define a complex simulation scenario. So for example, this is, this is an uh, implementation uh, which is being calculated uh, in, in the cloud with a lot of uh, ECUs and, and uh, CPUs available. Uh, we have to simulate different cars uh, the different driving dynamics from uh, different OEMs, for example. Uh, the uh, sensors are very complicated to simulate. We have to simulate the infrastructure 
information from the infrastructure, pedestrians and so on. And then we put this in an in interaction uh, like uh, you are going to drive with your car outside, then accidentally anything happened in the traffic and we have the same environment, very complex environment where you uh, can test arbitrarily uh, situations and sceneries uh, with uh, the combination of a lot of simulations of different cars, pedestrians and so on. And the interesting thing is that uh, the simulation, the special very detailed simulation can origin by the OEM, for example, it could be calculated at the OEM. So the OEM hasn't to give anything outside of his company and only the result of the simulation are synchronized uh, with the simulation done in the cloud. In the cloud, we have a very coarse simulation and this is matched with the detailed simulation from the detailed models from the suppliers and from the OEM. So typically we can aim for about 70% virtual testing of different scenes, but this has to be combined in a, in a very smart manner with real testing scenarios. So the true story is that you have to combine virtual testing and real testing. So starting from the left, you can really simulate thousands of sceneries, millions of uh, kilometers of relevant scenes, also complex scenes and dangerous scenes. But also you have to verify this and some corner cases, you have to simulate either in the simulator with the interaction of the, of the human being uh, in, in certain situations, as well as you see, this is a small vehicle that you see on the, on the left, it's called Spider. It's a kind of small autonomously uh, running vehicle with a complete safe and secure uh, computing infrastructure layer. And there you can test, for example, sensors in certain sceneries without having the car already available. So when the car is being developed, you don't have the original car very early, but you have to develop and test your sensors and um, the performance of the sensors in different sceneries, different weather conditions and so on. And then you can test this with, with this small vehicle, for example. And uh, the final stage is testing on um, public roads, for example, like with our automated driving car, we are allowed to drive on public roads uh, to make certain tests with in certain sceneries, as well as you can test also on proving grounds. So you have a whole tool chain. You have to combine different tests for a effective tool chain, combining real testing and virtual testing. So what is interesting in the development of the product is the value of the testing you have achieved. So you have to combine relevant test scenarios as well as methods, simulation methods, as well as me um, measures to achieve a certain quality in your validation. So the contribution for the functional validation is done by different steps, by the uh, complete virtual simulation, by the testing of sensors, for example, driving simulation as well uh, with the auto autonomous cars on proving grounds and on highways and, and public roads. And you have to combine this to a quality measure. How good is the validation of your overall function of the car? And you see the, the red arrow with the system simulation governance. So system simulation governance is coming up since about two years and it deals with a kind of quality and processes for quality assurance uh, to achieve a certain level of quality in your simulation and in your testing. Because for the authorities, you have to provide uh, the traceability of what you have done in testing and you have to show that uh, a certain defined quality is achieved by all your different uh, testing measures. And the, and the combination of the differing, different testing methods and uh, the provision of a development process assuring the defined quality, uh, this will provide a testing which is enough even for the complex cars 
we are expecting to come on the road in the next couple of years. Thank you very much for the nice insight into the topic of testing. Um, you said that we need a combination of virtual and real testing to actually um, bring the automated vehicles on the market. And you were telling about an aim of 70% of virtual testing. Is this already practice that um, nowadays only seven, uh, yeah, seventy percent are virtual tested, and uh, only thirty percent are um, tested in real life, so to say. And the follow-up question: Would it be possible in the future also to bring the ratio up to, for example, ninety-five percent virtual testing to five percent of real testing? I start maybe with, with your last question: um, the level of of virtual testing depends on the kind of, of functions you are really testing. So concerning uh, certain functions like vehicle safety, uh, there is a long tradition since the beginning of the 90s uh, to make crash simulation for, for passive safety and later on also for active safety. There it's for a lot of functions, it's already the case that 95 uh, of the testing is done in simulation and only a final validation testing is, is done by hardware. So it de depends on the functions you, you are looking at. And if you talk about the complex functions of different driving assistance systems and autonomous driving levels, uh, I think we are, we are still fighting um, with the complexity in, in simulation to achieve um, the appropriate quality in, in simulation. So like I have shown the very complex uh, co-simulation we are, we are doing in the cloud, as well as a combination with a detailed simulation at the OEMs and uh, the tier one and tier two suppliers. This will probably and hopefully come to a solution, I think in, in two years, which a higher degree of simulation quality will achieve. And then the percentage uh, will go to about the 70% in, in complex systems. But I think today a lot is done in, in real testing on proving grounds. So for example, for the Euro NCAP testing, still today uh, everything is done on the proving ground, but there is a roadmap concerning 2023, 2024, where even Euro NCAP will go uh, to a more scenery based testing and validation, and then the simulation will come into account. But today, your end cap is only real testing. Okay, thank you very much. And also, thanks again to all speakers of the technical session. The session gave a really good overview on technology needs and the related research aspects, still leaving some open questions related to a broader context and the relation to the current pandemic situation. If the AMAA conference wouldn't be just a virtual talk like today, but a regular conference with 100, 200 people here around in Berlin, we would probably have emphasized a lot the idea of co-creation. So a participative discussion on, uh, on, on our assessments and our understanding of future technology needs. All right, so in a deep dive with three experts, uh, we looked into the different dimensions of uh, intelligence based in the vehicle and in the infrastructure uh, as we should do that should do that for the topic of this conference intelligent system solutions for uh, automobility and beyond and as I said uh, I believe this is a quite complex topic that uh, requires to take into account different perspectives and different expertises so a perfect topic for a co-creation session the closest we can get to co-creation is by a panel discussion, I think. And this is what we are trying to do now. And it's looking quite familiar to what uh, all of us are doing every day now uh, with video conferencing during uh, the pandemic crisis. So I'm having three experts with me here in the panel today. Um, the first on the top right is Anna Rossi. Anna is in charge of technology intelligence for the group strategy of uh, Forisia. And she's also chairing the 
uh, R&I Working Group of Klepper, the European Association of Automotive Suppliers. Hanna, hello, Anna, how are you doing? Hello, I'm doing fine, thanks. The second one on the top left is uh, Jochen Langheim. Jochen is the Vice President Advanced System R&D Programs at ST Microelectronics and the Chairman of Aripedis. Hello, Jochen. Hello, Gerion and everybody. Yeah. And the third on the bottom is Ricardo Guapo. Ricardo is the CEO of Ideas in Motion and the chairman of uh, the working group Transportation within the European Technology Platform on Smart Systems Integration, EPOS. Hello, Ricardo. Ciao, ciao, Gero. Hello to everybody. So what we wanted to try to discuss in this panel discussion is not just the topic of this conference, so how intelligence should be distributed between vehicles and infrastructures, but with this paradigm shift that we're seeing in future mobility and in automobility, we want to understand how this situation is changing in view of the current COVID-19 pandemic. And we also want to try to understand what impact this has on research and innovation funding policies. And all of you therefore are here because you all have a technical background. You also have important roles in your companies. And at the same time, you also are strongly involved in innovation policy. So let me start with, with you, Anna. Um, Anna Faresia is an automotive supplier that to my understanding is focused on seating, interior systems, emission filters, so all essential parts of a car. In the current situation, at least from what we see and understand, demand on cars is dropping heavily, value chains are breaking up, and the COVID-19 pandemic seems to have quite some severe economic impacts and consequences, particularly in the automotive value chains. So why do we still need research and innovation? So, uh, yes, uh, we need research and innovation, and we will need research and innovation even more. Uh, on one side, uh, uh, even with the COVID crisis, uh, our requirements for having a, a more environmental friendly mobility, a more connected mobility will not go away, uh, even more will stay. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we, we see uh, that uh, there are some new needs and requirements from the consumers uh, that, uh, that arise that are very specific to this uh, crisis here. Um, and I will, uh, I will detail this a little bit better afterwards. Uh, and on the uh, third dimension, what you see is that uh, you have uh, shifting uh, trends that uh, are not so clear today and are conflicting. Um, and this goes uh, from, on one side, people are working more from home, so they need less mobility. On the other hand, people don't like very much anymore to go by public transportation and so on. So we'll need more individualized mobility. Uh, Anna, you were uh, saying, you were that, saying that the user 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 demands, demands customer and demands customer. are changing. What, what do you have in mind there? Um, I'm having in mind there uh, that, uh, that uh, up to now we have been seeing uh, some trends like share mobility become uh, or mobility as a service uh, become uh, as uh, let's say one of the new trends. Uh, on the other hand, what we see is that uh, uh, especially in, uh, in the unsecure environment of, uh, of the pandemic, uh, we will need and uh, we will uh, feel at ease uh, more in an in a individualized mobility. So that's, uh, that's something which is uh, conflicting. On the other hand, uh, if you think about uh, a vehicle interior, uh, a vehicle interior is the perfect uh, environment where you, uh, you will share a confined space with people. Uh, and uh, it's an it's ideal place where you can uh, uh, spread a virus uh, because of the air quality and so on. Uh, so it's uh, mobility as a, a place uh, associated to health. Uh, it's something completely new 
And this is something that I really It's a very exciting address. observation. And uh, let me try to bring in Ricardo into the discussion here. Ricardo, from the perspective of the smart systems industry that uh, you are representing as uh, chairman of the working group transportation in EPOS, um, we, can you explain a little bit how um, these different application fields that were mentioned, transportation and health, from that perspective are coming together? And uh, particularly if in view of the, the strategies that we have developed so far, we were looking very much into just vehicle intelligence and emissions, but it seems to be bringing in uh, a new dimension now. And my, I'm wondering whether all the strategies and roadmaps that we have developed so far, whether we can scrap those. Uh, well, first of all, um, I like very much, and I was 100% um, aligned with the, uh, what uh, Anna said before. So we are observing, uh, especially here in Italy, the tendency towards um, personal mobility. This is uh, this demand is increasing. Uh, I can say that if we had automated vehicle already now, this would help a lot. This would be very appreciated. So uh, I believe that what we have done so far is still valid. Um, maybe we will have some delays uh, on some specific domain but again what we said uh, in, in, in the previous years so i mean the automated electrified vehicles and the shared mobility will come maybe um, as i said with, with with different timeline but this is still uh, let's say in the mind uh, of the customer and also in the mind of the of the main players um, this must be very good news for for you guys. I mean, ST Microelectronics as a um, as a manufacturer of you know. microelectronic systems and all the enabling technologies. You probably are not just serving car, car manufacturers, but a whole bunch of of, of different application fields, right? And uh, my question is, uh, what 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 observations have you made about changing? user uh, behaviors and user demands in view of the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, what, what impacts does that have on, on your product portfolio? Well, we, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this, this panel discussion. Um, I think that, um, first of all, our company has, has very well performed through this, uh, this COVID crisis because it has been considered by the uh, national uh, governments in Italy and France as a strategic uh, company that had to continue operation in order to make sure that everybody gets what he needs in order to make his products. That means not only for automotive, but also for consumer products, for industry all over the world. So uh, semiconductor industry has not stopped working. Uh, if, if we would have stopped working, it was, uh, would have been catastrophic. I think it has shown that uh, once again, there are some key enablers that are existing in the world that need to, to be strengthened. And then we are coming to your question concerning what, what have we seen in terms of um, uh, direct impact. So the, we have seen that uh, yeah, people don't, uh, don't want to use uh, public transport or cannot use tra public transport because the constraints are such that uh, either there is no train or you have no space or you have to be careful with, with uh, the, the, the virus. So everybody is moving to his own car. He's trying to get uh, with his individual uh, transport as little contact with other people as possible. But um, uh, and, and they, have, they have stopped uh, using Uber or taxis or whatever. So it is a, a disruption. Yeah. Disruption. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Jochen, yeah. but this Jochen, sounds, but sounds to me like a U-turn in uh, and strategy for yeah, future mobility because our future vision also driven by uh, considerations on mitigation of climate change, of social inclusion and so on, was, was emphasizing a lot these, these shared modes as a way to, uh, to make better use of resources in the city to give more opp opportunities for people to, to use transportation. But what you are saying is pretty much saying it's going back to owning a car and doing the ego thing there. Is, is, is that the future or is there even a, a way around that? And actually this is a question to all of you. Yeah, I don't know what to say about that. Yeah, go ahead. So uh, 
I think we have to, as all problems, we have to see it as an opportunity because uh, mm -hmm. somehow the technology is there also to address this kind of uh, issues. And uh, so probably what we will have to look at, uh, it's, uh, I just give you an example. Uh, today we use uh, sensors inside the vehicle to detect dangerous conditions like uh, droneness and so on. Uh, the same sensor could be used, for example, to monitor, I don't know, health conditions. Uh, I'm speaking about the heart beat or uh, temperature. I think if I may just say one thing on shared economy, shared driving, we have seen this with the experience in France uh, on Autolib, this shared electric vehicle. What was the main problem was that these cars had to be kept clean. You had a lot of needs for services for people to take care of this. You don't want to get into a car that is dirty. You want to have a car that is almost uh, like your own car or like a rental car or taxi that is clean. So there is a I think a lot of things to do, maybe even by companies like Forestia who can develop some interior that can be cleaned more easily for, for shared mobility. But unless this is, is done, it's difficult to do. Then the, is, the, is, is the idea of the automobile changing in this context? So what we just heard seems to say, well, we are on the right track. We just need to adapt a little bit the technologies. We will find solutions for that. I mean, that's very promising. That's very good. But how do you see that? I think we have in general to take care and to step back. Because if you have now this, this situation with the virus, this can also happen on, on a voluntary basis by anybody who puts a virus in our cybersecurity system. So uh, if that's happening, it can have the same effect. So we have to take care. And I think at the moment, separating the solutions, decentralizing the, the control is one of the best methods to do this. And before putting it all in the same basket, I would wait a long time. Okay, very promising, okay. but I want to hear Ricardo's opinion about it. Um, uh, I understood that the commission has, um, uh, let's say, uh, um, put the, the, the pressure on the accelerator pedal on a, a, a new set of uh, features to be integrated into the vehicle, something like 15 safety feature that uh, will be mandatory uh, by 2022. Uh, at the beginning, the original plan uh, was about 2025. Now the, the, there are discussion about uh, anticipating uh, this, uh, uh, this set of safety features. Uh, and this is somehow reconnecting to what uh, Anna was saying before. So we are talking about uh, the drowsiness um, uh, alarm uh, system. In general, uh, the capability to better understand the health status of the driver, not only of the driver, but all the, all the occupants. And uh, um, all those measures uh, are, uh, let's say, giving uh, impulse to the, to the automotive sector, because we are talking about uh, uh, not completely new, but uh, the, the, the final application will be uh, demanding and uh, there will be space for uh, many, many players, for, for the big and for the small one. The I know other that, point I is, know, but let, me, let me interrupt but let me, you here, please. Um, I know that, that you are, I mean, known for rethinking the car once in a while. I'm thinking of, of uh, the small electric cars that you developed in the Silverstream project and things like that. And I'm just wondering, what do you think uh, that, that from, from the, the idea of the car itself, will it be more a shell for a single person in the future to be really like safe again also compared to others? Will it be more a, share, a shared version? Will it bo more be like something that is the same path we are on today with automotive technologies? Yes, in some way, yes, uh, because again, if uh, uh, at least for a certain period of time, there will be uh, a focus on uh, individual mobility, at least here in, in, in Italy, we, we have the practical problem of the lack of space in the historical center. So having uh, small vehicles, uh, electric vehicles, let's say green vehicles running in, in the city, uh, this could uh, trigger the, 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 the demand for new solutions. Uh, and yeah. The big, the big, uh, what, the big we, what we should not forget. Jochen. Looking back three weeks, 
everybody was at home, nobody could move with his car. We had a lot of home office. It worked very well. Yes. So there are many uh, politicians and people who are working in the, the funding authorities, even the, the president of the French bank uh, from the BPI uh, said this. Uh, why shall we send people from one screen to the other to just sit there and uh, meanwhile they are occupying the streets, they have traffic jams. There will be certainly a lot of thinking about, let's say, imposing home office a little bit more in order to reduce this, this uh, usual traffic. So that means for us, uh, uh, other consequences. What, what will we do uh, in terms of equipping houses, equipping uh, schools uh, with, with the right equipment so that we can do home, more home office, more home uh, schooling, that is one thing. And then uh, there will be certainly questions on how can we protect that? Uh, this is the second question. The third is, uh, what can we do in order to make sure that the people have always something to eat when they are at home and they cannot get out. So we will have probably some kind of a closer agriculture, uh, which is more industrialized, this vertical okay, agriculture. I understand the past. I want to know whether, whether Anna is agreeing with that. Will there be less mobility in the future after COVID-19? Do you agree with that? I just to say something. A bit. I don't think that the share mobility is dead. Uh, uh, personally, I think it's something that uh, somehow uh, we, will, yeah. we, cannot, we cannot drop it because uh, because of the CO2, because of uh, even if probably there will be less people on the streets uh, related to, uh, to more uh, working from home. Uh, but, uh, but a new focus on the user experience inside the car will be given. Will this also and, accelerate, uh, accelerate, uh, will this uh, also accelerate this also other steps in future mobility? I mean, we are discussing drones a lot. We are discussing um, uh, telepresence and things like that. So probably go all together. And uh, coming back to what uh, Jochen was saying is that uh, uh, because you will be working from home, uh, you will also have uh, uh, more connectivity, and you will probably uh, want to find the same environment that you you have at home in the car, so that to have when you take the car to have a certain continuum between the home and the car. Mm -hmm. I do have one more question to all of you, and uh, this comes a bit, it's going a little bit back to the original topic uh, of the, the first discussions uh, this morning when we talked about <clears throat> research and innovation funding. And uh, we are now in, in, prepare, in the preparations of a, a new framework program, so saying we, I know all of you and ourselves as well, we are uh, trying to help preparing the partnerships for Horizon Europe. We are looking into zero emission. We are looking into connected and automated mobility and all the enabling technologies. But uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic, do you think part of that thinking has to change or whether, uh, say, developments that we are planning have to accelerate or that we need to put focus onto other things. I, I really want to know what you are thinking of that because th those processes started a year or two years ago and also the, the priority setting started a longer time ago. Is there anything where we could say, okay, there's a lesson learned already of what needs to be taken into account there for the planning of Horizon Europe? Who starts? Yeah. Well, I think that we have to think back, we have to think globally, and we have to think about uh, difficult situations, catastrophes or whatever, that can have an impact on uh, our industry, on our way of life, on our health, on our agriculture. We have to take this into account because it happens all the time and we have not done this enough, I think. Uh, well, if I can say, my personal experience has been involved into the preparation of the of the air track roadmap uh, which was presented uh, at the end of march in brussels uh, and uh, i found uh, some innovative touch uh, with respect to the to the propulsion technology for the for the for the years ahead so since we are talking about a carbon neutral environment by 20, i believe 
any of can the any of the others hear yeah. us? Uh, yes, Anna, do you want to come in? We cannot yeah, hear I can, Ricardo. I can, uh, I can step in. On my side, I think that some fundamentals remain valid. Uh, so uh, CO2 neutrality remains uh, remains a valid uh, mm -hmm. goals. Uh, also, uh, a more efficient mobility as a whole in terms mm -hmm. of uh, that can where autonomous vehicles is one of the drivers also remain uh, fundamental, which is valid. If uh, something can uh, can bring as a new dimension that uh, probably has uh, been taken into account uh, uh, less in the past is uh, is the user experience uh, and uh, the reaction of the consumer to uh, to 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 what we see in fact. That's, uh, I mean, this uh, this I, I, you all of all of you emphasize that, and I'm I'm seeing that seems to be a trend, right? So we we have been discussing the. Uh, stronger involvement of users into strategic planning for future transportation and mobility a lot already, but this seems to increase. But I do have another question. You're touching a little bit upon it, but uh, honestly, I have not yet really seen the statement on it. And I, I would challenge, want to challenge you a little bit with that, uh, actually all the three of you again. Uh, the big paradigm for the European Union is the Green Deal. It has been just announced as the, the big thing they will also take into account, not just for research planning, but also for recovery plans and so on. Will that change? Will that change mobility more quickly now? Or will it even take longer till the, the goals of the Green Deal will be implemented after the crisis? I mean, there's the economic side and there is the innovation side, I guess, right? Ricardo, can you hear us again? And maybe you can hear your comment on this you got lost, you got in lost in sorry no, yeah, sorry. good year back, good year back. <laughs> uh, no well con concerning the green deal i can tell you that for instance uh, in italy the government is preparing a new set of rules uh, supporting the let's say the restart of our account and uh, um, at the moment the idea is that turin uh, will be hosting uh, uh, r d activities in a very focused manner uh, with the support of the government uh, in tight, uh, let's say, relationship with the, with the main idea uh, uh, pushed by the Green Deal. So the, the, the concept here is that we are going to implement in some manner and uh, follow what uh, the Green Deal is inspiring us. So yes, I believe that uh, the, despite of the difficult situation, the Green Deal will, uh, will guide us for a carbon neutral environment. Yes. So, Anna, faster, faster or slower Green Deal in transport? It will be probably faster. I hope so. Yes. Because uh, <laughs> yes. uh, we have all seen what it means to not to have cars in the, in the streets in terms of air quality in the last days, yeah. uh, which is uh, somehow something that will uh, also, uh, I don't know, influence us uh, in, a, in a way or the other. Uh, but it's something that uh, we will need to, to also to deal with the mobility uh, needs of people, which is a fact. Uh, so um, it really depends on how uh, policy and regulation will influence one side or the other side as we will go. So I would hope that the Green Deal will, I think it's, it's a, it remains a fundamental. Jochen, last Jochen, word last on that matter. I hope that uh, what we have seen in the last weeks, the new, uh, uh, ways for cycles will remain and they don't uh, get rid of it again to uh, replace it by the old way of traffic. Okay, okay. thank you very much thank to very all much. of you. Anna Rossi, Jochen Langhein, Ricardo Grappo, discussing in a panel discussion within the AMAA 2020 virtual talk. And we discussed a little bit the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on uh, the innovation funding trends and particular in future mobility, also in view of Green Deal and the big paradigms that the European Commission is having on that matter. And I think we got as closely as we could and as promised to co-creation. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all. Thank you. Ciao, Jochen. Now with me is my colleague Benjamin Wilsch. He is the coordinator of the European project COSMOS, which is driving the mobility e-lighthouse. 
Benjamin. At the beginning of the AMIA virtual talk, we discussed the new partnerships within the new European Framework Program Horizon Europe and their role in promoting clean, connected, automated and smart mobility. How does the Lighthouse, the Mobility e Lighthouse, um, facilitate the strengthening of electric, connected, and automated driving? Um, well, if we look at electric, connected, and automi automated mobility, then um, it's of course a very broad topic with um, a lot of aspects and topics to it, as is reflected by the um, many partnerships that are active or that are planned for for this topic, um, being. 2.0 for electrification, CCAM for automation, but also other partnerships such as the battery partnership, of course, all play into this, um, this general topic. Uh, and it is thus necessary to look at all of these topics, topics together because they cannot be isolated. There are dependencies between them, there are synergies that can be exploited. Um, and, and that's where the Mobility Lighthouse comes in, to act as that kind of connection, um, as a networking and collaboration platform where all the stakeholders um, in the field of electric connected and automated mobility can come together, can exchange ideas, and can work together to accelerate progress, progress in the field. Um, the Lighthouse was initiated by the Excel JU joint undertaking um, and was thus initially more focused on the lower ends of the automotive value chain dealing with um, electric, electronic components and systems. Um, and the first project that was introduced into the Lighthouse, um, because projects um, are one of the main instruments around which the exchange in the Lighthouse is organized. So the first project, AutoDrive, um, was dealing with that part of the automotive value chain. Um, but in order to expand that dialogue to the entire automotive value chain and also beyond the technical aspects of electric connected and automated mobility to non-technical areas, um, other pro projects have been introduced into the Lighthouse, um, dealing more with the application side of the value chain, and, and we are continuously growing this platform to enable um, um, dialogue between all stakeholders. Okay, so with the introduction of different um, European projects within the Mobility Lighthouse, which are the specific goals that the Lighthouse pursues? The um, overarching goal is to accelerate progress and deployment of electric, connected and automated mobility solutions uh, in order to achieve the benefits associated with these in terms of um, inclusiveness, uh, safety um, and also uh, use of urban space, for example. Um, that's the overarching goal and to do that, again, we, we try to really involve all the necessary stakeholders in the dialogue. Um, to share best practices between them um, and just to, to make sure that perhaps also um, areas of where collaboration and cooperation are needed are identified and um, yeah, cooperations are initiated. Okay, to do this, I mean to like strengthening the collaboration along the whole automotive value chain, what are the exact corresponding tools and measures that the Mobility e Lighthouse is um, trying to um, <laughs> so it, the Lighthouse, um, I should add, has been in place for about for around three years and has in the past years built heavily on on-site events, on meetings, workshops where experts would come together and discuss ideas. Uh, and that was one of our um, large events last year. We had the ECA 2030 um, networking and collaboration event in Brussels in October last year, um, where stakeholders came together to discuss their viewpoint of what is necessary, what are the next challenges, what actions need to be taken, and also to derive research priorities. Um, so that was something that worked very well for the Lighthouse and for its objectives. Um, but since, especially in the past months, we've been, it's been necessary to also build more heavily on virtual tools. We also have the Mobility E web platform, which is um, accessible online at mobilityE.eu. And that is um, a place where we share results of the um, Cosmos project that drives the Mobility e Lighthouse um, concerning, for example, research priorities, but in the future also um, actions in the field. Um, we have um, events that are announced if we, we will be able to have uh, <laughs> on-site events again soon, hopefully, or um, online events as well. Um, and yeah, just a platform for exchange between all stakeholders where everybody can participate, but particularly also the um, Lighthouse project in a sign-in area can collaborate and exchange ideas. 
so far, you mentioned mainly measures related to the um, networking activities as well as the collaboration platform, including um, also the expanding of the relevant stakeholder circle along the whole value chain. Does the Mobility e Lighthouse also um, satisfy a more strategic role? Um, yeah, there's also a strategy development process that we are pursuing with the Cosmos project for the Mobility e Lighthouse, um, where the main objective is to make sure that the different strategies um, drafted by um, the various stakeholders along the value chain are, are well aligned. Um, so that's something that we've been doing throughout the project and we will continue to do. And the two main activities there are um, aligning the research priorities, so defining which topics need to be addressed right now and by which stakeholders. And secondly, the um, actions that need to be taken by the stakeholders, for example, fields of, or areas of collaboration, to overcome hurdles that are perhaps um, delaying the deployment of connected um, electric and automated mobility solutions. So to summarize from my point of view is the Mobility e-Lighthouse is basically a yeah, collaboration and network platform which also fulfills some strategic um, development processes to kind of combine all stakeholders within the whole automotive value chain and even beyond, right? So yeah, uh, in fact, um, it's addressed at everybody. So um, I mentioned before the Mobility E web platform, mobilitye.eu. Um, so for example, concerning research priorities and action plans, there will be public consultations. So um, yeah, please, everyone that's watching, um, visit the site and participate in our public consultations. Um, thank you, Benjamin, for the great insight into the Mobility e Lighthouse. Today in our AMA virtual talk, we elaborated on the future political and technological framework conditions for electric, automated and connected mobility. Furthermore, we complemented this with the topical discussions on um, the influence of the current pandemic situation on the automotive value chain, as well as the respective research um, needs. Yeah, thank you, Caroline, for this little summary. Um, we actually want to thank all the speakers in the panel discussions and the different contributions uh, of this virtual AMAA Talk 2020. We thank all of you for your interest. We are also hoping that all of you are coming to the conference uh, that will hopefully then take place in reality in the coming year in 2021. And Caroline, I think we also have to thank Jakob Michelmann for all his support in uh, coordinating the technical side of uh, today's virtual AMA talk.